first of all, yeah, thanks to Jim and Neville and Gwilym for inviting us. Um, it's, it, its title is The Digging, Digging Towards the Future, The Changing Role of Archaeology in Urban Planning. And we're looking at a way of extracting more value, or more, more of the values we interpret from archaeological sites in design and planning process, and the interdisciplinary side about how we can develop a corporation to support the process, essentially. My name's Tom Davis, as you know. I'm an archaeologist, but I'm at the Archite Architecture School in Oslo. And well, I'm an architectural historian, uh, working quite a lot with built heritage, but primarily modern stuff. <laughs> But I've been uh, for a while now researching underground structures in architecture and planning, which is kind of the theme that coincided with Tom's uh, professional background. So that's uh, that's the platform for this collaboration. And uh, right. should we, should we roll switch on? places now? Yeah. I promise to have a dynamic that. operation going on. Here. You may get a laugh when we fall over each other. <laughs> yeah. So what we're trying to explore here is. Um, uh, the case for archaeology in providing a more leading role in urban development and <clears throat> how this might be brought about through certain new ways of thinking. And we have listed three key questions. How can the value of archaeological insights come to better use in urban design processes? What is the current state of interplay between archaeology and urban design and how might this be developed further? And thirdly, what role do multidisciplinary cooperation and community engagement play in this? And at an overall scale, this is, a, this is a highly relevant problem right now in planning. Uh, it has to do with underground issues such as flooding. I'm using here the example from Houston, Texas, where they have annual problems with flooding due to hard surfaces and uh, systems below ground which are capable of tackling uh, the flows of water. There's also, in many cities across the world, a uh, problem of uh, heavy tunnelization, uh, tunneling, uh, which makes it difficult to actually build new things around the city because it's full of holes. And also um, a problem that came up uh, last year in Oslo, uh, private holes in the ground that comes from people digging wells or uh, other installations to utilize energy on their own properties. But there is no coherent mapping system for this. It tends to happen sector by sector and obviously there is now need for it. <laughs> Every profession working below ground should collaborate more to, to create systems that allows planning to act more uh, coordinated and more efficiently in, in big schemes. And now, Steve. And moving on, um, we're looking, I mentioned about how we might extract more value from sites through the design process, and we're kind of looking at kind of moving from preservation in situ and preservation by record as kind of established practice to what's kind of a bit anachronistically called preservation by design, but means in terms of in inputting into design process from archaeological, archaeological data. I just thought it'd be to go through the three just to recap what we mean by preservation in situ in terms of remains of high significance and being worthy of preservation, UNESCO sites and so on. And then the recalls of professional archaeology, a lot of the time preservation by record that we clear sites and create, create records of them for prosperity. Um, and then preservation by design, as we're kind of ter terming it, would be looking at, it bases a little bit on what typically happens with standing structures where they're retained in part or whole or represented through landscaping elements when, uh, when buildings are removed. But this goes further into the idea that you might be able to extend interpretation of values, stories and other aspects of site into the design process. So go beyond signage and internet representation of information from sites to actually include it in the design process with architects, planners and other, and other, uh, other agents engaged in that part of the design. Um, so you know, uh, we've been doing a bit of a literature review on this, so Evans can talk through some of the key texts we've been looking at. Yeah, my investigation into this issue started with this particular uh, pair of uh, Raymond Sterling, John Carmody, an American engineer and an American architect who founded uh, the American Underground Space Center in the early 1970s in Minnesota. And that was an effort to gather engineers and other disciplines working below ground, such, such as geologists, to expand knowledge on, on what's below ground, but also to think differently about the design potential to actually build different structures uh, below the surface of the earth. This, of course, was fueled at the time by, by the Cold War, um, the need to build bomb shelters and so on, which we'll get 
back to. But the point is uh, that they were making already in the 70s what was that, and that's the quote from the book, once you open a hole in the ground, it should be used for as many purposes as possible, whether it's archaeology or technical stuff. So they did point to that at the early stage, and they made this list of, of potential and dangers that you need to think about when they released kind of a summary of their work in 1993, the so-called Underground Bible, Underground Space Design, which came out. And this eventually, uh, here's a picture, it eventually also sprouted different practices below ground. This is an example from Norway, the Jörvik Olympic Mountain Hall, which was used during the 1994 Winter Olympics. It was built by a company called Fortification AS, who were uh, founded by the military defense in the 70s and 80s to uh, devise combinations of sports halls and bomb shelters below ground. And of course, this has nothing to do with Archaeology in the traditional sense, it's, uh, it's an excavation, of course, that blasted this whole enormous wall into the mountain. Uh, so I could guess, I guess we could call it some kind of Cold War archaeology. But the point is, anyway, that uh, once you start digging for any, any kind of purpose, it should be coordinated into a, big, uh, into a much bigger process than simply catering to one specific need. Um, just going to mention also the current strong interest in the low ground structures and architecture. This is the work of a French architect called Dominique Perrault, who has a project ongoing called Groundscapes, which is a theoretical uh, project um, uh, collected in this book called Model Topographies, but it also comes with a practical interest in, in designing for structures below ground. I have an example here, if you push the next arrow. This is a path project in Paris that he designed. As you can see, it's a submerged structure in the park. They also do buildings below ground and so on. And again, it's a, it's a witness of a certain interest in architecture, in, in working with other disciplines to, to dig and to excavate and to possibly combine architectural design with archaeology and ecology and so on. So now back to you. So taking the literature view, we've been doing kind of how to go uh, very broadly categorising how we got to the situation we're in today in terms of planning and archaeology. So you take it from kind of the advent of archaeology in the 15th century, which is very from antiquities and object focused, moving into 18th and 19th century, refocusing on sites and the development of early legislation, uh, which is engaged in things like developing national identity and telling the stories of nations as they form through the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, the early 20th century, from what we were reading, can be kind of categorised by quite a high period where lots of other disciplines are drawing inspiration from archaeology. Um, and at the same time, legislation is developing as archaeology develops its mandate and is supported by the state through legislation, which begins to protect the development of protection of monuments first, and then as the 20th century progresses, becomes more about historic environment. Um, Coinciding with this, or alongside this, archaeology shares space with a lot of other disciplines in the mid-20th mid century that it typically housed with anthropology and social sciences in different universities, and then became, began, uh, became as it distinguished itself and other disciplines did at the same time, they can separate it into their own departments, so there's a kind of a high period of cooperation that actually reduces in the later 20th century. There's also, we see reduced funding, and the thing that I think uh, kind of is most relevant to today's situation is the way that preservation by record carried out through professional archaeology is very much based supported by legislation allows us to go in and do it and that gives us our mandate it's what we're talking about in terms of broadening support gives us more community more interdisciplinary support alongside the support uh, alongside the support we have from legislation so this would be we've i know it's effectively established archaeology as a discipline um, we've gone from object to monument to historic environment and we've moved from a material focus to a focus on communicating the values of sites and not necessarily taking the materiality forward but the values of what those sites tell us. Um, so I've briefly already summarised the bottom part of that. Uh, so we did a kind of mapping of where, in how, how much cooperation we have with different disciplines today which green is obviously high, high cooperation, that we sit very comfortably with anthropology, ecology from consultancy and other areas, and we borrow, borrow frameworks and ideology from each other. Geology, uh, as we saw earlier, sits in with archaeology companies, 
um, in different ways, in archaeology in other areas. Um, and um, the yellow area is things that we have input with, so 3D modelling and TVA, TVA and landscape in terms of built heritage setting and historic view stuff and then at the bottom end of the table areas that are more that we have limited cooperation with today and the thing that came through a lot in the literature review is this idea of recentism that these red disciplines are social sciences and economics tend to work solely with textual sources therefore stopping in the early 1800s and not considering the economy's archaeological evidence from Roman civilization or earlier uh, one way of explaining it so, but we're also looking at how uh, the current situation in terms of what we do with mitigation strategies and in situ, in situ preservation and how we work to reduce the cost of evaluation and preservation by record. Um, uh, how we need to consolidate broad and this support. And we have architects and planners often show an interest in heritage, but we're more concerned a lot of the time with working with the requirements of planning, planning, planning mitigation that we don't necessarily have enough space to discuss things fully. Um, and then we have benefits such as digital development is cutting costs on engagement and bringing community and other disciplines into things, reducing publishing costs. And um, in the bottom two points refer to you know, broadening this engagement, increases support, and the climatic situation at the moment and sustainability issues tend to in, will produce greater interaction between disciplines naturally, so there's kind of a view towards the future. Um, so the kind of the different points we're thinking of in terms of preservation, preservation by design might implement would be things, for example, responding to demarcation of key boundaries in sites, so historic precedents on sites in the determination of uses of new buildings or layouts, carrying roads forwards, uh, forward as we saw in an earlier presentation today. Um, and so different aspects of that nature, and then materiality, and also you could potentially look at the form and mass of earlier buildings, and otherwise conveying stories. So it's good to go through some examples of, the quite diverse examples of different approaches to this today. This is from Antwerp, there's a, a museum of the self and archaeology that was proposed for the tunnel system under Antwerp. It was quite an interesting idea. And then moving on. Yeah, and of course there are already some examples where archaeology has been very tightly intertwined with other projects. You probably know this one, many of you. The uh, 2004 Olympics yielded new metro stations in, in Athens, and they used the opportunity, of course, to uh, not only dig and ex excavate, but also to make these new exhibition spaces where you can see the actual archaeological findings integrated in the metro architecture. And it's not a very revolutionary form of exhibiting architectural findings, but it's nevertheless an interesting example of a process where archaeologists work really, really closely with transport planners and, and architects in designing these stops along the metro. And it works exceptionally well as a place of communicating archaeology, uh, archaeology to, to an audience. They, they typically take school classes and so on. Um, from my field, built heritage is, has been more and more usual work like this with structures that are no longer there. Uh, probably the, the most iconic example is the Berlin Wall. Uh, and as you visit the so-called Berlin Mauer Gedenkstätte, the memorial, you can walk and see different versions of how uh, the wall has been reconstructed along the route. For instance, as a transparent fence, so here to the left, or just as, uh, as markings in the form of, of paving on the ground. Um, another example, the last one from Berlin is the reconstruction or the reconstruction of an old prison in Moabit, a 19th century prison that was demolished and has now re-emerged as a landscape design project. And you can still visit the site and you can experience the exact layout of the, of the prison, uh, every room, the courtyards and so on. But it's definitely no longer a prison, so it's, it has been radically transformed, but through new design building on history, it can be read as, as a memorial site still uh, in the contemporary city of Berlin. Right, well to conclude, I just thought I'd summarise the points that we points we're making essentially, that we want to look at discussing archaeological data as a means of informing the design process, uh, trying to look at more community engagement as a way of building support behind this, that it's not enough 
to be doing it just with, uh, with the planning within the planning system as it is at the moment, um, and also further de further develop support for the corporation with other professions. So thinking about that green amber red coding, where we can build on that, and then how we might involve other groups such as NGOs to assist in outreach and other tasks where there are established networks that sometimes we in when we're not working closely with other disciplines and other groups, end up doing things that other agencies might be able to support us with or do more easily because they have established networks, that maybe building those bridges we'd be able to save ourselves some working areas and refocus our efforts on the things that we need to spend time on. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you.